Okay, so here we go. Happy New Year's everyone. Welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to be going through the second part in my Paradox Breakdown series and we're really going to be getting into all the juicy stuff, exploring his techniques for programming and processing drum breaks. I'm also going to walk you through what I think is the best approach for achieving this intricate drum funk style in a modern door like Logic. Now, people really fall into two categories when we think about how they're chopping their breaks. In the first camp, we have people like Paradox, who actually like to extract all the individual elements from a drum break, like the kicks and the snares and the hi-hats, and then to reprogram the break with all those individual slices. And if you see here, I have all my samples here. And then you put them together, forms a break. Simple as that. Now in the other camp we have people more like Botech who actually like to program with slightly longer sections of the break that will include multiple hits in each section and then to use these larger sections and chop all the previous ones off as you're building it up. This is how I'd start, start doing the breaks. If you listen to, to this line here that's just the one straight up break as it was. This is the kick, kick drum here and this is the snare so you can split it. And you can, you know, you can do whatever you want with it, really. I'll just do a stupid pattern here. So that's the, that's the main sort of jungle technique of making the drums. What I actually want to get in today is a way we can combine the best of Paradox and of Fotech. And what we're going to do is build a four bar pattern that's going to have all the key ingredients we need to reprogram everything later on. Okay, so I think it's worth me explaining what I actually mean about having the perfect set of ingredients in your drum break and what that actually involves. So firstly, we want the drum break to actually have a cool rhythm. And a really good place to start for this is to actually reference a real drummer and especially one of the classic breaks used in drum and bass, like the Think Break or the Funky Drummer. And to program your break in a similar style, because therefore you'll, you'll capture a lot of these classic drum and bass rhythms that are, that are in those drums. We also need a nice clean hi-hat, as well as some shuffles, so ghost snare and hi-hat combinations, and sometimes having multiple shuffles is really useful. And then a whole bunch of different kicks and snares as well. So uh, when the drummers played, you know, when they play, they'll have different levels and slightly different pitches from where they've whacked the kicks and snares. And so they will sound tonally different and it's really useful to have a variety of these. And then finally, actually some kicks and snares with longer tails to them or uh, longer reverbs to the kicks and snares. And really, once you have all of these ingredients, you can create so many intricate grooves when we get to the programming stage. And sometimes if you don't have them all, you, you get a little bit stuck about what you can do. So I really think if you have all of them in your break, you've kind of got the perfect setup for programming later on. OK, so I'm in Logic now. And the first thing I want to talk about quickly is that you actually want to try and find a break for this that has uh, that spans quite long in length. And you can see here I've got like an eight bar break and this means I've got lots of different hits to choose from to build my perfect break from later on. Now the next thing we've got to do is actually to slice a perfect segment out of this break and generally I, if I just pull this out you can see I've actually just got rid of a little bit of the end of it there but if I just play this I can hear it somewhere around here where it starts to loop again to the next bar. So in there, this is this kick that comes in. So I'm going to zoom right in and put a little slice in there. And then I can just uh, select this and command you to loop it. I was just checking there that I looped around nicely. So now I've got a, uh, a perfect eight bar section from my break. Okay, so the next step is actually to start quantizing our drums. And in Logic, we have this flex time. So I would go flex and slicing. And then firstly, I'm just gonna warp this to fit in this perfect eight bar section. And here I've stayed very close to the original tempo of this break. We will speed up to drum and bass speed, but we're gonna do that a little bit later on in this tutorial. 
What I'm mainly focused on here is actually quantizing all the main kicks and snares to the grid. So I would go through and you've really got to do this manually and quantize all of these beats to the grid. So in this one below, you can see that I've actually done this here and gone all the way through. And you can leave some of the shuffles with the natural swing of the drummer. Now from my analysis in the first part of this Paradox Breakdown series, I discovered that he does actually program his drums very tight to the grid. But he's still able to achieve a very natural drum sound. And what this is, I think, is a little bit of confusion out there about what actually makes drums sound natural. So first I'll play you this little clip from David Rossum again, where he explains how a very tight drummer can get a groove within one or two milliseconds of a grid. Later on, we did some accurate measurements with, with drummers and found that uh, drummers really can do better than one millisecond accuracy if, if they're really good. That's, that's the mark of a professional drummer. What we learned from that clip is that actually a real drummer can play pretty much dead on the grid, give or take a few milliseconds. But what is making their drum break sound natural and not computerized? Well, actually, it's a whole bunch of other factors, such as the natural decay of the hit, so the way the hits are ringing out, as well as having different tonal qualities, all the kicks and the snares. So every time you hit a kick drum or a snare drum, it's going to give you a slightly different pitch and tone and rattle, and all these things are going to come together to making the drums sound natural, as well as obviously velocities and things like that. So I think that swing and micro timing and offset notes are definitely good ways to add humanization, but you can still achieve quite natural sounding drums, putting stuff fairly close to the grid. And that's what we're gonna explore in this tutorial today. Okay, so it's time to start building this perfect four bar passage that I've been banging on about. And I think the best way to start here is actually to reference one of those classic breaks that you always hear in drum and bass. And just to get an idea of good grooves to have in your break. So I've got this uh, Clyde Stubblefield cold sweat break here and I'll just play this for you quickly now so you can get an idea of where we're going. Now you can hear that even though we're playing it at a much slower BPM than drum and bass is typically played at, you can hear a lot of those classic drum and bass rhythms in there. And so it's a very good break to copy from. Now what I've got here is this top is just the bounce of that full eight bar break that we uh, warped and quantized in the beginning. And then here is my, my ideal four bar passage that I've started to work on. And I've just shown you where I've extracted different hits from all around this break to build this perfect four bar passage. Um, so I've got it quite close to the start before, especially in terms of where some of the shuffles are and the rhythms. I've tried to get as close as I can, but also take things in my own way. Okay, so I've just shuffled things around a little bit because I want to show you how I'd actually build this from the ground up. So really, I just listened to this reference break. So I've got sort of this kick snare and then the shuffle thing happening. And if I go to my break... So I've got this good start, but now I need to find a shuffle. So I'll go through this break here. So I have a bit of a shuffle there. I have a nicer shuffle here. So I would take this shuffle down and just start to play with it until it sounds right. So let's go. Um, there's a neat little hot key you can do in Logic, which is just going to go is shift and then um, the backwards dash, and it's just going to auto extend that to fill that gap. So we've got another kick snare. So I'm going to actually go and find a different kick from this break at the top. Oh, perfect. So I have this section again. And um let's just make sure that's nicely on the groove okay and let's maybe solo this that one can go off nice what's happening here in this section so we've got hat sort of another shuffle and then a kick again but more of like a subtle kick um so maybe i can take this section for the shuffle Move that around a little bit potentially and I need a kick snare. I could try and just take this and see what happens with this. Mm, just looking at the groove. 
Nearly. Nearly, nearly. Okay, so I finally got something that I'm happy with and that actually sounds as good as the first time I attempted this, but it always takes a lot of work and a lot of fine tuning and nudging things around and swapping the hits. But this is something that Paradox would actually do and he talks about this on the Dogs on Acid Forum about the way he would swap out kicks and snares and shuffles to make his perfect breaks to help them flow better and to make them more leveled. And so he's doing a very similar process when he's preparing his breaks or when he's building his drum breaks from the original break. One other thing I love to do at this stage is to create lots of variations from the snare drums. And some of you will see, have seen me do this before, but I basically use a, a big reverb plugin and then quite often I'll mono out the reverb as well. And so I'll take lots of the uh, individual snare slices and then I'll put them through that chain and then I'll get these big reverb snare hit and they're just really useful to have as effects and different things we can throw in when we're programming our drum break later on. Okay so the next thing to do is to actually warp our break to drum and bass speeds and I've set my BPM to 175 and I'm just going to use that flex slicing thing again and then we can listen to our break and just see how everything's sounding. So it's got a drum and bass feel, but to me it sounds really cluttered and busy. It doesn't sound, it sounds quite crazy and it's quite hard to listen to. And one of the reasons for this is actually people would often pitch up their drum breaks to get them to a drum and bass speed. And so if I pitch this up, you can hear. At that faster speed, the higher pitches are a little bit more defined. But as we're staying true to Paradox's style, he would very rarely pitch his drum breaks up very much. Actually, he would usually pitch them down a semitone or two if pitching them at all. He was really about um, capturing the original tone of the drum break. And so whilst, whilst we can't pitch it up to help everything sound a little bit more clear and to slow down the sound of the break a little bit, we can employ a few other techniques. So if you listen to the start of this break, you'll hear it just sounds a lot less busy than that one before. And the reason for this, and Paradox actually talks about this as well in the Dogs and Acid Forum, is not having this double kick at the start. So if I pull this break out, you can see it's got, got a double kick here. And it just makes everything sound a lot faster. Whereas if I pull this uh, kick away and replace it with a section of the track from later on, everything's a lot smoother. And this really brings me into the point I want to make about magic markering. Now, someone on the Dogs and Acid forum asked, what is this magic markering to talk about? Well, I believe it's about using the reverb tails and chopping little bits of the break together to make hits that weren't originally available in the lifted break. And so you can see here, I've got this kick down here. And then I have this kick at the front. Now this is a much punchier, more aggressive kick, but actually if I take this tail away, for me to use that kick when I'm programming, I've always got to have that double kick going. But what I really want to do is have that slower kick and I can then turn that into a double kick if I want to, but it's much better to have this longer kick as a sample or as, as a tool to program with. And this is really what he's getting at, is patching parts of the break together to make hits that weren't originally available. And so you can do this with kicks. And you can hear it sounds just like a natural kick there by nicking the reverb tail here from the break. Now, you can also do this with other elements. And what I've done here is actually taken this. I've got a ride sample there, but if you listen, even though the ride is playing through all those hits, we only have this part of the ride accessible. So what we can do is drag this ride to a new track. And if I come here, I actually wanna just reset this flex. And if I just blow this up so we can listen to this alone. I've got the ride, but it cuts off way too early. I want the ride to ring out a lot longer. And so we can do some more of this magic markering. And the simplest way to do this is actually to take the ride and to flip it 
get rid of the hit and then move this back and kind of join them up. And there's a come into your volume envelope and you want to have this, because the, the reverse sound of the ride is now whipping back up, I have to reverse that with a volume envelope to make it all sound natural. So I'm getting a little click. I'm not sure if that's coming from the start of this sample. So I've got, now I've got a much longer, this was my original ride length, and now I've got this ride. And we can go again and actually go and take this one out again, flip it round again, and keep continuing with this volume envelope down to keep it sounding natural. Maybe something more like this. So now I've got a ride that wasn't actually originally available in the track, and this is really handy because it's the exact tone of the ride that the real drummer had. And so I can use this to actually cover up as a sort of a camouflage in my track to cover up little edit points. And so if I show you here, So what I've been doing is reworking this groove even more to build this perfect four bar passage. But in doing so, I'm disrupting a lot of the natural tails of the samples and I also have these quite jarring gaps as well. So one way I can cover up these gaps is obviously by doing that forwards reversing technique that I did before. To create some more natural sounding reverbs of the hits, but also having a ride like this to layer under the whole beat just acts as a, as a camouflage for all of these little edits and it really helps to add another layer of realism to the break. But I've done a few things with this flex timing. I have firstly gone and done some clip automation. So all of these rides are actually at different levels. And then also with this ride specifically, I've actually shortened it in length. So I am man manipulating the ride a little bit as well, just to make it sound even more natural. Okay, wicked. So now let's get into some processing. Now, the first thing to note is that Paradox would actually like to process his breaks as one whole unit. There are some techniques out there about chopping all the kicks and the snares and the hi-hats into all their individual lanes and processing them all individually. Whilst that's a very viable technique, you do get this nice cohesive sound when you process the break as one whole unit. So we're gonna follow in Paradox footsteps there. The second thing he would like to do is actually to have his drum breaks in mono. And in Logic, it's really easy. I just have this game plugin and you can stick mono on. And I would actually tend to agree with him here that having your drum brakes straight down the middle in drum and bass, especially at this fast speed, really helps sometimes with the mixing. Uh, you have your drums and your bass right in the middle and then everything else can be in the stereo field. The next most important process with our drum brakes is always going to be EQ. EQ is going to do the most to tonally shape your brakes to sound the way you want them. This is especially true when we're lifting breaks from old vinyl records from, you know, the 1960s or 70s. They're always going to take quite a fair bit of work to get them to sound like they belong in a modern setting. Now, I actually think the best thing to know where to go with EQ is actually to reference other drum breaks and other tracks. And so I have this paradox break here. Which is a great sounding break. I really like how bright it is and, and I think it's just got a really nice tone to it. So it's a really good reference point. And if I listen to my break in comparison, obviously I'm still not very close yet, but I'm getting there. And if I take this EQ away, it sounds like the whole thing's under a carpet. So you can hear, I have got all this other processing on as well, but this EQ is making a massive difference in bringing a lot of the brightness out adding some more bass and also this frequency here in between around 200 hertz and 800 hertz is these uh, muddy low mids and there is a lot of warmth there but there's also a lot of this mud and boxiness and all these other words you'll hear people say. But you always want to look there and see if there's any frequencies you want to pull out and if I just show you here. It actually makes the drums sound a lot cleaner and almost a bit louder and brighter. Now, when we're thinking about processing our breaks, we're using EQ to totally change the break and to make them brighter or give them more low end. But actually, we've also got to think about loudness and 
getting our brakes to sound fat and up front. And this is really about the peak to uh, average level ratio of the brake. And without confusing this too much, we're we use things like limiting and saturation and compression to soften some of the peaks and bring up the average level of the brake. And so uh, on our meters, it's going to be hitting the same level, but it's actually going to be a lot louder. And I'll explain this more as we go through this process. The next thing I'm going to is probably my favorite plugin and it's called Decimal 2 and it does lots of things with filtering and sample rate reduction but actually the preamp drive here I really love and it's got this analog desk style um, saturation it gives you and you can kind of smash it and it gets quite distorted but at these lower levels it's got a really nice saturation. I've also got another EQ here and what I love about this EQ is it's a more ear focused EQ. I think some of the graphical ones, whilst they might be more precise, you end up using your eyes more than your ears and actually here, just by flicking a few of these knobs around and testing out different frequencies, I could just start to hone in on completely different sounds I would never find with a graphical EQ. So I think it's really useful to go over your initial EQing sometimes with an EQ like this and just to really listen and see if you're happy with the work you did. So the next thing I've got on is a transient shaper and this is such a useful plugin and this one by Native Instruments actually drives it into a limiter so you can just add transient and it's just going to shave off anything that's going above 0 dB. Anyway I don't go too crazy with these so just a little bit of transient shaping can really help and one thing to note is that when we saturate things and when we pull down some of those peaks, we can smudge the transient a little bit too much. So sometimes having a transient shaper after saturation can add a little bit of that spiky hit or that punch back into your drums. The next thing to talk about is actually layering our break and Paradox will talk about the way he would back up certain hits with drum machine samples such as the Roland drum machine samples as well as using other certain kicks and snares from breaks to reinforce um, his new break ideas that he's making. So what I actually did for this project, mainly for myself actually, is I've gone through all my favorite breaks and loads of drum machine samples and picked out my favorite, I've got 139 samples here of loads of amazing kick layers and snare, snare layers for backing up these breaks with and some of them were re recommended by Paradox and lots of them I found myself. Loads of great stuff there and because I could put a lot of work into this sample pack I'm always a bit wary of just giving this stuff away for free but what I will do I think is if I get a thousand likes on this video someone hit me up and I'll put it in the comments of this video. So um, if I get some love from all of you guys I will send it back your way. But the main reason I went through and created that big playlist is so that I can chuck them all into a sampler in Logic and have all of these hits all on different layers of the sampler. And whilst audio might be really useful for nudging things around um, and looking at the phase, I actually find MIDI for drum layering is way more efficient because you can have a playlist like this and you can cycle through loads of different tones and find ones that match with your actual breaks in the track or actual hits in the track. Now a few other things that are really important when we're talking about drum layering are the tuning. So the great thing about having a sampler is you can pitch things up and down in the sampler as well as actually having control over the amplitude envelope of the hits. And Paradox also talks about this in his articles about how you can, when you're layering breaks, it can all sound really unnatural if the layered breaks have not got the same uh, ringing out, if they don't decay in the same way as your original hits in the break. And so what I've done here with these snare layers, if I actually just um, copy this and make it slightly longer, I've just made the hits a little bit more snappy, but that's just helped them fit a little bit more as a layer underneath my original break. So those things, as well as nudging around some of the hits, are really your tools when you're drum layering, but it can take a very long time and it's not always the easiest process. Especially these snares here, they just make them sound a little bit more punchy and powerful and that, I wasn't trying to change the game, I was just trying to reinforce some of the hits. 
Okay, wicked. So now we've got some more processing to go through and sometimes it's just about referencing and then it's just applying more effects and just keep going until you get the sound that you're looking for. And so I've done a whole bunch of things here. If I kind of go from the beginning, uh, I've done more EQ, taking out more of that muddy range and just to make things probably sound a little bit clearer. So a little bit of EQ there. I've got this true iron, which is just doing some more saturation. And Decapitator doing more saturation. So lots of plugins here. Don't feel like you need to go and buy these. You can just use stock ones, but you know, when you've been making music for a long time, you end up just buying lots of plugins. That's just one of the curses, I think, of being a music producer. One thing I do want to talk about here is compression. And Paradox actually mentions how he would rarely use compression um, because he believed that sometimes it sucks the soul out of the breaks, but also not to be scared of it as it can be a very useful tool. Now, when we're thinking about compression and what it's doing with drum breaks, it's often about leveling out the hits of a drummer. So when they play a really quiet hi-hat and a loud snare next to each other, you're just bringing the levels of those two hits closer together. But actually we can get around that using this thing called clip gain and you will have this tool in your door and you can just go through all the clips and you can see I've actually just clip gained all of these clips to different levels to balance them out the way I want them. And so that's really a way we can get around using compression as a level balancing tool. But here I have used compression and I've just used it very subtly like one dB and I'm using it here more like saturation or just like a little bit of glue on this break. The other thing that compression will give us is actually uh, some attack on our samples. So you can use compression to emphasize the peaks or the initial transient of samples. But we can also do this with transient shaping. So once again, I'm doing a little bit of attack and I've actually left sustain at nothing now. So I'm just adding, similar to before, we did all that saturation, pulling down the peaks and I'm just adding a little bit of the transient back in before I'm going into my limiter. And so in this way, we can use clip gain automation and transient shaping to do a lot of the same things that compression would be doing, but then we don't have to have the sound of compression in our breaks. One final thing I'm doing is a little bit of clipping here, and I'm only doing a dB of this, but I'm just getting a little bit more of that peak to RMS level out of this break, and I'm just making it a little bit louder, hopefully, without sacrificing too much by just shaving some of the peaks off. One thing I'm doing again at this stage is I'm quantizing the whole thing again. Now, this is kind of getting to the final form of this break before we go and start programming it. And quantizing it again, I did mention this in the beginning, but it's really important, especially if we're gonna work in a sampler and with MIDI, to have all these kicks and snares nicely quantized to the grid. Okay, so now we've got to the programming stage and I'm gonna do a whole bunch more of this in the next tutorial and try and make a full track and go through lots of tricks and techniques to do with programming. But I think it's worth just showing you a little bit in audio and a little bit in MIDI here of what, how I would approach this. So we've got our perfect four bar break now, which we've processed to hell and we've reworked it and we've really got all the ingredients there that I've been talking about to, to then reprogram at this stage. Okay, so let's just start to rework this beat and I'm just gonna start messing with the audio and see if I can come up with some cool rhythms. Okay, so I like that, but then I wanna replace that kick with another kick. So perfect, so I've got these kicks. I can bring this down, I can bring this one out, and then I wanna take one of these shuffles, so let's just take this shuffle and put it in here. See how this sounds. I think I maybe wants a, a hi-hat, so where's this hi-hat? It actually wants a longer kick, doesn't it? So this is why it's useful to have these long kicks and long snares. So I can use this long kick here. I could even try and use the tail of this kick there and just piece things back together and see if that's gonna work. Maybe come back. There we go. Boom, cap boom, boom. OK, 
Okay, so I finally got something that's sounding a little bit more cohesive and is making sense. And it has taken me a while, actually. I'm a lot better at working with MIDI than with audio. But what I really just want to show is the way if you look at all these segments, I'm sometimes I'm taking little clips, but a lot of time I'm taking slightly longer chunks from our break. And it really helps just to inspire ideas. And we're just nicking little bits of groove from our break and sticking it all together. <laughs> Whilst I enjoy working with audio, I much prefer working with MIDI and anyone who follows this channel knows it's a Renoise focused channel which basically is a, a big sampler and everything we're doing there is in MIDI, there's no audio in that program. And one of the reasons I banged on about this quantizing so much is because when we're working in MIDI, it's so much easier to, to be actually able to program all the MIDI notes on the grid and for everything to line up rather than if you've got all these swung notes, suddenly programming MIDI notes off time and nudging everything around, it gets really confusing and it's really difficult to actually achieve a good sound. So let's create something from scratch and just see if I can do another little recreation of a passage like that. Okay, so I've got another groove now that I've done in MIDI and it's a very similar concept with pulling out certain beats and having slightly longer sections and then also pulling out the bits of MIDI. Whenever you find something you like, you can kind of look either side to find new grooves and rhythms and patterns. And I think it's a really intuitive way of working and um, I really, really enjoy doing it in MIDI a lot more than audio. Now, I did talk right in the beginning about the perfect set of ingredients and I just want to show you here what I mean by this is that I've got all these different tones of snares that I'm calling upon so that every time almost I'm hitting two snares in succession, there's slightly different tones of snares. But also having the shuffles and the hi-hats and having clean hi-hat and shuffle samples as well as having these longer kick and snare samples just really gives you like the perfect melting pot of ingredients to make really complicated grooves and I'm using these um, hi-hats and the shuffles so that's my hi-hat there and that's my shuffle and I'm using them so that I can move around the placement of my kicks and snares so I'm really thinking about the kick and snare rhythms and then to, in order to fill in the gaps between the kicks and snares, if they don't go long enough, I'll use little shuffles and hi-hats to bridge and, and piece everything together. And one last thing at the end here, thank you very much anyone who's made it to this point and is still watching. Um, I'll take this mo this moment to just plug my sample pack and this little demo track I've made here has got lots of the samples from that pack in it. And I've put a lot, a lot of work into it and I'm really proud of some of the textures and the pad sounds in this sample pack. So you can check that out on my website and I'll just play this little demo track to roll out with and I hope you've enjoyed this tutorial. I'll try to go as deep as I can on this and uh, really flesh out a lot of Paradox's techniques. And you can catch me in my next uh, tutorial, hopefully in the next couple of weeks sometime, doing uh, a more re-noise focused tutorial, maybe making a track uh, continuing in this jump funk style. So anyways, I'll catch you then and I'll roll out with this tune. Peace. Could you just prove, for example, that the Martians have bred a race of synth